pleasure to be here. Thanks, Bean. Um, so my group's probably best known for work in data visualization. But I'm actually going to talk about something different today um, that started off as research, um, still is, has many interesting research questions, as I hope you'll agree, but also served as the basis of Trifacta, a startup company. So the work I'll be sharing with you today is primarily the work both of myself, but also my uh, co Trifacta co-founders, Joe Hellerstein, a database professor at Berkeley, and my former Stanford PhD student, Sean Candle. And um, I'll you know, tour through a lot of data-related issues, including both visualization and data cleaning. But you know, the overarching realization that we had is that, you know, in general, our software doesn't really know what we're trying to do. Um, and so the basic idea was, from a user interface design perspective, what does it mean to make software a more first-class collaborator and sort of the type of work you're trying to get done? Um, and so basically the question is, you know, what if it did? And as I raise this question, you know, some of you might be having, you know, horrific flashbacks, you know, and need, uh, you know, therapy sessions from relationships with sort of failed AI agents like this. Um, and while I don't want to get too distracted, there's a number of things one could dissect into the history of Clippy, including the fact that the original system by Eric Horvitz and others was sort of lobotomized before it was turned into a product. Um, nevertheless, you know, it's not always an initially positive reaction when you talk about software trying to proactively or at least reactively help you get your job done. So I think of maybe a more useful place to start with something a bit more modest, but things that we use every day. So for example, you know, spell checking and grammar checking, you know, it's, um, you know, it's a useful thing. People are, you know, software is analyzing what you're doing and then hopefully adding non-intrusive annotations that might be useful to the task. So the software does have a sense, even if vague, that, you know, of what I'm trying to do. In this case, that whatever, for whatever reason I'm writing, I would like to write in a grammatically correct um, way with, with correct spelling. That may not always be true if I'm doing, for example, experimental poetry, but in other cases, that assumption holds. Um, but another example I think we use every day um, to the point where it's become ubiquitous, where we might even stop realizing how helpful it is, is things like Google's autocomplete. Right, so here I start typing in, not only do I get you know, uh, filling in of, of what I might be meaning, but I also automatically start getting previews as I type of what I'm doing. And so the basic idea, as you're all well aware, is that you know, use the context and data, all the past searches people have done, to try and predict you know, useful search terms as well as automatically preview results. And this can be very valuable in a number of cases. So just today, you know, I need to find out you know, where the address is. I start typing in Allen Institute. It shows me a number of different institutes disambiguating my query. And as I go forward, you know, it shows me the location so I know where you know, here in South Wallingford to go. And along the way, I might learn some other things by these auto previews. For example, I see Oren Etzioni highlighted there. So maybe I'll search for him instead. And I'll learn other interesting things. And so for example, I might not have known about his relationship at the University of Washington. Of course, I do, but others might not. Um, but what I think is neat about this is it's not just completing my intent. It's like I might you know, give a little bit of a hint, and then it will jump to the conclusion for me. I think one of the things that's interesting to consider here is how our, our use cases may be ambiguous. We may be doing search exploration. We may not know exactly what we want to do. And I might go off on an entirely new vector, such as you know, investigating Oren's finances, uh, which was you know, not necessarily obvious to me, but apparently the internet thinks it's interesting. Um, so the idea is thinking about not just how do we get things done faster, but how do we do more, maybe even do things that we, we have a sense of what we want to do, but we don't exactly know how to, to achieve it. Um, and so let's just look at this from a more schematic uh, standpoint. And we're going to build up these schemas over time into richer models. So in this case, we start with the text box, obviously. And we can start typing in our query. Um, and it's a good interface. We immediately get a response. Obviously, we see the characters we type. But we also see you know, these auto-completions, which are driven by a predictive model. So for example, looking at what other people have searched for um, over time on Google can lead to a number of suggestions. And those populate the drop-down menu. But we also pick the, end, the top pick and then automatically render a page of search results. So trying to jump ahead, not just in terms of the query, but actually executing that query and showing the results. And at that point, I have to disambiguate. Do I want to go with that top suggestion, or do I want to refine it more? Maybe my choice is on that list, in which case I'm done. Or maybe something's close, but I need to type some more and revise it. So I have this feedback loop here. Um, but the overarching thing is that you know, it's a machine and a person working together, in this case, to, to issue a query. And initially, I start typing, which is I'm going to guide the system, that is, sculpt the space of possible predictions, and then ultimately disambiguate from a set of choices. So I'm going to have to decide, given that the system has done a search and given back what it thinks are the best options. Right? So this is one way in which we can um, start to have these more predictive machines, and that, you know, obviously, I'm trying to write a search query. It's trying to help me do that. And that's well and good, but I don't think the problem is solved, because this is a, has some very nice properties that makes it a bit easier. So for example, one of those is that the input and output domains are identical, and that's text. 
So I can type in a text box and I can see the suggestions rendered within a text box or a drop down list. Um, and so that feedback loop from a user interaction design perspective is quite easy because you're working with directly within the same medium. So the natural question to ask when we want to generalize this is, you know, what about more complex input and output domains? What are ways we can generalize this strategy of predictive interaction into more complex computational tasks? So that's what we're going to look at today. So to kind of to cut to the chase, you know, these are the objectives of the types of software we want to build. Obviously, we want to accelerate people's ability to complete their tasks successfully. We also want to allow people to do very repetitive things or tasks involving large amounts of data more effectively. Um, as I alluded to earlier, we want to support discovery as well as ambiguous intent. Yeah, with a vague notion of what I'm doing, can I actually get a sense of new opportunities? Um, and also, I want this to improve over time. Just as Google um, search queries learn from usage, we would like to do that in more complex domains. So the fundamental strategy we'll be applying to do this is through the design of domain-specific languages. So that is we're really, you know, it's kind of almost a classic AI idea, right? Find the right representation for the problem domain and use that as a formal reasoning structure. And so we're going to use language models to predict potential actions. And then we'll also see the systems benefits of this, and that by having a language model, we can actually decouple the UI from scalable runtimes. For example, using compiler technology to take what's done in a UI and let it run across giant clusters. So that's really kind of cutting to the end. Um, um, just to put some motivation there, we're going to look through two examples. Uh, the first is uh, uh, from Tableau, visualization software developed right down the street here. And second, from a tool called Trifacta and its research predecessor, Data Wrangler, which is uh, what, what our startup produces. And so just to, to provide um, some motivation for why we're looking at this, you know, why domain-specific languages? Why do we focus on this area? Well, the first, as I mentioned, is we can model a task as a program. And many times, the program structure is quite simple, though not always. In many cases, it may even just be a sequence of actions. Imagine the types of things you do in Photoshop. The history there is really just a sequence of operations applied. Um, but even with these simple models, it gives us a, you know, a really nice formalism. A, if we include statistics over that model, we can start reasoning about actions. What are the possible steps people are going to take next? Can we enumerate the space of possible actions, rank them, et cetera? Um, also, this provides a means of learning from usage. We can update that language model over time. Um, and then we get these system advantages I alluded to earlier. So by modeling what a user does in the UI, not just as an idiosyncratic application of maybe manipulating photos or data, et cetera, by being able to generalize that to a program, we can reply it to new inputs, which allows us to do things that are in a repetitive way. Um, we can also cross-compile it to different runtimes. So we'll see examples of doing things maybe on a you know, resource-limited client, but then taking that program and compiling it to run at scale on a cluster. So with that motivation, uh, let's look at some, some concrete examples. Um, so the first is in the area of data visualization. So how many of you are familiar with Tableau? You know, as a company, sure, but as a UI, how many have used it? All right, so, so less of you. So I'll do a quick introduction to the UI here. What you have on the left is a schema for a data table. And it's been partitioned into discrete dimensions, so things by which you might you know, group by the data. And then quantitative measures, so typically things that you might aggregate, where it's meaningful to say sum, median, min, max, et cetera. And then you drag and drop these different fields off into shelves here to map them to visual encodings. So whether that's spatial encodings, like the rows and columns of this table, or things like color, size, et cetera. So for example, given this dashboard, I'm looking at my, my sales figures for different categories of products across geographic regions. Maybe I want to drill down for more detail. So I can grab this segment field, I drag it over here to the row shelf, and then by doing that, I'm able to subdivide the rows based on the segment here. And so now I might get a slightly more nuanced picture of the data. And here I see my sales. I might want to start asking questions, well, how does that relate to the, the, the profits in each of these areas? So I can drag and drop the profit field up here. And then you see I've actually subdivided into two side-by-side -side visualizations, one for sales and one for profit, but all subdivided here by, by category for these different columns. So the idea is to hopefully provide a relatively intuitive drag and drop user interface where you can rapidly create visualizations to ask analytic questions of your data. The point that's relevant to this talk, however, is that underneath this is actually a formal language for modeling the space of visualizations, for including these uh, possible table partitions. So for example, based on these different data types here, you know, we can zoom in and look at this specification. Well, this looks like a set of nouns, right? So I have different you know, um, data variables, and I've assigned them to different visual encoding variables. Um, how is this actually translated into a visualization program? Well, based on these data types, whether, for example, they're dimensions or measures, a set of algebraic operators are actually inferred. So what you're doing is first taking a concatenation of sum and profit, 
You're then taking the cross product of that set by category. And then uh, for the rows, we're actually looking at an operation called a nest, which is basically a cross product, but one in which you leave out missing data. So for example, if I was to nest by quarter, I wouldn't necessarily want to see all 12 months you know, nested in every financial quarter because nine of them would always be empty. So a nest is sort of a sparsity aware cross product operator. So doing this, it actually forms a table algebra. And hopefully by looking at this, you can you know, certainly reason about how this table partition would be constructed. But what's interesting is this same language is then cross compiled to a different domain without of actual SQL queries that you run against a database. So for example, by looking at the uh, dimensions here, the discrete measures, um, we can actually formulate things like the group by clause and various aggregation statements. So we're actually translating from what the user has produced here into a formal language that is actually uh, being interpreted in multiple ways. One in terms of a set of visual encoding operators, another in terms of database queries that can then be issued to backing systems. So to review, I mean, this is what Tableau calls VizQL. It's a DSL, domain-specific language for tabular visualization. And so based on you know, these simple operators and operands, as well as the visual encoding shelves, we actually have this language for representing the space of visualizations. And again, these are compiled to both visualizations and database queries. And the interesting part here is that the user does it by drag and drop. They're not actually aware of the underlying language, but through a little bit of inference, you know, the actual um, um, statements are inferred and then the, the visualization is created. So to put that in schematic terms, you know, we could actually just write code in this underlying formalism, and that provides you know, a base for creating a, a wide variety of visualizations. So given our data set, we could write VizQL statements and then produce visualizations, which are kind of the rendered results of the, the database queries that were executed. What we want to do here, though, of course, is map this into a more uh, friendly and intuitive interaction domain. So in this case, you know, something that I can you know, drag and drop fields. So I have my database schema. I drag and drop them onto the shelves. And this actually constructs language statements. So in abuse of category theory, I'll call this you know, lifting from the domain of the, the VizQL statements or the DSL to an interactive domain where we can use visualization and interaction instead of writing code. Um, and then at the end of this, of course, we take that visual specification and then ground that back down in terms of a language statement, which then can compile, interpret, or execute. Um, and so what we're doing here is saying, well, can we achieve DSL programming by the composition of like three kind of fundamental ideas? Lifting to a visual domain, performing interactions in that domain, and then grounding it back into the formal domain. And when we you know, come up with this phrasing, basically for visual programming, you know, a number of questions could arise. One might, you, you might be thinking already is, you know, are these languages isomorphic? So what's the expressive space of the interactive language versus the underlying formal language? Well, it turns out in this case, they are not isomorphic. So for example, things that are actually legal statements in the underlying language, like the cross product of two ordinal fields as opposed to their nest, or concatenating two ordinal fields instead of quantitative fields, can't actually be expressed in the visual language. Basically, the way it infers the language statements from the drag and drop operations precludes those options. And so in this case, the, you know, the footprint of the interactive language is smaller. In this case, I'd say it's actually a relatively judicious design decision is that you know, the folks at Tableau and prior to that in the Polaris project at Stanford were looking at ways of how can we really help people generate visualizations more quickly and these, these options are less likely. And so basically the trade-off was in favor of usability versus expressivity. So these are just some of the things that are not just technical in nature but rather a design question that arises as you start following these strategies. And so I wanted to provide this example as a way of looking at these mappings between more formal and visual domain. And now we're looking at ways of like taking our auto-complete you know, auto example and this example and start thinking about how they might fit together. And so uh, one point I'll make is while well, Tableau is one example of this type of strategy, there are many other applications that also follow the sort of language lifting approach. In fact, we've used it in a number of projects in my own lab. And just one example I'll share is Lyra, which is a visualization design tool. So the idea here is something akin to um, Adobe Illustrator for data visualization. So you have largely you know, drag and drop interactions as well as direct manipulation of moving marks around on a screen. But underneath this is actually a formal language, in this case Vega, which is a declarative language for visualization um, for allowing um, what a user does interactively here to actually produce a program for, for a example could be applied to new data. So a number of different ways in which we try and find these interactive um, analogs um, backed by underlying formal languages. But now let's move on to a slightly more complex and hopefully more interesting area, which is uh, data wrangling. Yeah? Two quick question. I, yeah. I, I wasn't following how the idea you expressed about the system knowing what you want. Or, or ah, excellent. So what we're doing here is that the user is specifying what they want. And the main thing that we've worked on here um, is the mapping between the formalism and the UI. There's very little here, if any, about 
the system helping along the way. So what we're going to do next, thanks for the question, to clarify is um, how do we start taking that predictive aspect and then introducing it into a setup like here where we can, we can already begin to address more complex tasks than, for example, we could with uh, query autocomplete. But we're missing that predictive component. So we'll look at ways to add that in as we go in to talk about data wrangling. Thanks. Are, you, are these always designed so that the mapping from the kind of human-friendly language to the more human unfriendly language is a function? So that, I mean, because I can imagine like this upper language could be like natural language, for instance. But yeah. then it's basically the problem if there's this like non-determinism then between the natural language. Yeah, right. so, so great. So there, is, there can be non-determinism. So typically how this works here is the uh, mapping is made unambiguous. So in some cases, you may do something where, from a human standpoint, I could interpret this a number of ways. The most common thing here is actually just have a rule system that says, I'm always going to interpret it this one way. Um, we'll, we'll begin to look at ways where you can start to add in um, you know, kind of some of that non-determinism. So for example, suggesting multiple possible completions of an idea. Yeah. Um, and the other thing, of course, is that you know, this is always either equal to or less than the expressive range of this language. However, that's not always true in the process of design. So I notice that sometimes by innovating at the UI level, it makes you aware of things that your language has to include. And so part of the fun of these things is you're actually co-evolving these two representations together as you try and figure these systems out. Great, so let's move on to the example of data wrangling. So this actually came up from our own pain points as people who worked in data science and visualization for many years. We realized we spend an inordinate amount of time just getting data ready uh, for, for processing analysis and visualization. So we, we went out into industry and actually interviewed folks at dozens of companies. I think you know, since the founding of the company, we have talked to hundreds of practicing data scientists. And here's a representative quote. You know, I spend more than half my time integrating, cleansing, and transforming data without doing any actual analysis. Most of the time, I'm lucky if I get to do any analysis at all. And you know, interesting, when we first saw this quote, you know, we shared it with others. We thought we would get pushback. And it turns out we did. We've got a ton of pushback, but not in the way I expected. Um, you know, almost uniformly, everyone argues that this is an underestimate. Um, and so, for example, DJ Patil, who's now at the White House, but had run you know, data science groups in a number of companies, including LinkedIn, said we, in his experience, it's more like 80% of the time of his employees is basically in data preparation work. If you look at textbooks on forming data warehousing, you know, the cleaning and integrating stage is you know, at least 80% of the work as well. So we're spending tons of our time you know, getting data ready to do, and do the fun stuff, which is uh, finding out um, you know, actionable insights within it. So I think of this as something of the elephant in the room of data science research. You know, certainly for many years, this is where people were spending a majority of their time and not necessarily talking about it. So for example, I'd look at beautiful papers by colleagues at uh, visualization venues, and I'd say, OK, that's a really nice result. How much time did you spend actually prepping the data? It turns out they had spent more time doing that than anything they had published in the paper, yet you know, hadn't bothered to comment on it. And I'd argue that in recent years, this has become more front of mind. You know, certainly, there's a number of companies in this space now, including my own, and we've you know, sort of been kind of rattling our sabers. Um, and now, you know, it's now kind of common wisdom, you know, big data Borat reports. 80% you know, of the time in data science is preparing the data, and the other 20% is complaining about that fact. Right. So, but what can we do about it? So obviously, in statistics and databases, there have been a number of projects to try and improve data cleaning and formatting, uh, and you know, typically trying to take the approach of automation. And you know, at the end of the day, you really still needed a human in the loop. So we said, let's approach this instead as a human-computer interaction problem, but building on all the automated techniques that others had developed. And I'd like to point out that this happens even just with relatively clean data. So for example, you could go ahead and download this from the US government, in this case, the, the Bureau of Justice. These are some housing crime statistics uh, by year and state. Um, and if you load this into Excel, it'll load fine and you can manipulate it. But it's not in a structure where you can load it into any useful tool, including R, Tableau, a relational database. You still have to do a bunch of rearrangement of the data uh, to make it usable. And so this problem arises in, in many different guises. And so we set out on doing uh, a number of research projects, uh, Sean, Joe Hallerstein, and myself primarily, looking at new ways to combine automated and uh, interactive techniques to help with some of these problems. So let me start by giving you a quick demo of the original data wrangler system that we developed while I was on the faculty at Stanford. So here we go into Wrangler. And so you'll see kind of a familiar data table display here on the right. Um, you see we've also taken some steps automatically. We split the data into rows um, and into columns uh, based on common delimiters. And now what we like to do is clean it up uh, to try and make it amenable to other analysis tools. Um, you see a, a list of verbs, which are actually data transformation operations along the top. 
We'll come back to those later, but this is not primarily a menu-driven system. Rather, the paradigm is you select what you're interested in and then get suggestions of what you might do with it. So for example, we have these empty rows, which we don't need. So I can click row two, and I get suggestions on what to do with it. And we usually uh, you know, default to having simpler suggestions first that are easier to interpret. So a direct interpretation might be to delete that row. But we can also generalize. We see that that row is empty, and so the second suggestion is to delete all the empty rows in the table. And as I do this, you get visual feedback, right? These red highlights showing me what the effect will be should I choose to execute that transform. So I'll go ahead and hit Enter now, and you'll see that it gets added to my interactive history on the left, and the table view here updates. Now I notice I also have metadata buried in my table. Like this should be column headers, not you know, actual data. So I can select that, I get some suggestions, you know, one of which is to promote that to a header. So I can go ahead and do that, and it promotes that row, and now I have good column names. But I see that this also now needlessly repeats. So I can go ahead, and one of my suggestions here is to, by generalizing, is to do a deletion based on exact matching. So in this case, anything that has the exact same values, I'll go ahead and delete. And now we get to probably the trickiest part, which is we have these state names embedded in a text string, and we want to make that a proper column so that we can um, you know, analyze this data effectively. So to indicate my interest in that, I'll go ahead and select the text Alabama. And here the system has guessed that I'm trying to do an extraction procedure. But you can also see that it's wrong, right? Alabama comes out, but Alaska doesn't, and Arkansas is cut off. And this is because, again, we, we default to these simple interpretable transforms, which include matching on string, string position, um, as well as exact match, which is the term Alabama. So I could look for you know, useful d uh, disambiguations on the left, or I could probably more directly just keep directly manipulating the display. So if I select the text Alaska, I'm actually providing additional evidence, which allows it to prune the search over the space of possible extraction procedures. And now this looks good. So not only do I see the correct state names, and I could scroll down through the rest of the data if I wanted to, I can also look at the top pick here, and I see what's extract from the year column after the text in, which is actually what works quite well for this particular data set. So now if I go ahead and hit Enter, I add that extraction rule to my data. Now, as I've been doing this, you may have noticed some other things. So for example, I have these little type annotations on each column. So the system thinks this is primarily a numerical column. And then in green here is the, visualizes the percentage of values that actually do parse successfully as numbers. And then in red, I have all the things that don't parse. And similarly, it's found that this is a string column, but this gray indicates with a high percentage of missing values. And so these aren't just indicators of data quality, they're also actionable. So for example, I can click this uh, region to get suggestions of what to do. Now it may not be the best thing to suggest deletion of the majority of the data as the first step. Uh, but hopefully, you know, for, luckily for us, uh, the next thing is quite useful. So this is uh, to fill down. So in this case, we can look at various interpolation strategies. And for strings, this could be just simply copying up or down uh, based on previous values. So this looks good. Um, and now I almost have a complete data table, but I have these rows I no longer need. So I could throw out the things that don't parse, but that could be brittle. If any of you worked with spreadsheet data, you might have seen things like 2004A, where A is a footnote at the end of your spreadsheet. So instead, let's be careful and say, let's get rid of the rows that start with reported crime in. So here's a case where I select the text, and it initially guesses I'm doing an extraction procedure. But that's not what I want. So then here's where I can give it a hint. You know, focus your search on deletions. And in doing this now, I see I get as my top pick a deletion with the you know, predicate that I demonstrated. So having done that, now I have this nice relational data table. I could go in and, of course, rename this to state, but I'll spare you that detail. And at this point, I might be ready to now export my data to another tool. So if my data set's small enough, just a second, um, you know, to export directly, you know, maybe I transformed all of it in this browser-based UI. I can then pick my data format, CSV, TSV, JSON, et cetera, export it, and then you know, load it into my favorite visualization or statistical analysis tool. But in addition, I've actually built out a transformation history here. And this is rendered in this sort of pseudo-natural language. Um, but these are actually just renderings of an underlying DSL. So we have a formal language for data cleaning underneath the scenes, and that's what we're actually reasoning about when we generate those suggestions. So I could alternatively not actually publish the data, but instead give me back a resulting program. So for example, my data might be so large I can't fit it in memory of this tool, and so I might work with a sample instead, and then generate a program that I could run at scale back on the server. So here's actually a code for a Python runtime we wrote. We can generate JavaScript code. We generated Postgres queries, et cetera. We can take our intermediate language model and then cross-compile it to a variety of platforms where we can do larger scale data processing. 
And of course, we've since gone on to write um, you know, processors for things like Spark and, and MapReduce uh, for doing you know, very large scale data processing. So that's the, the, the demo of Wrangler. I think there was a question before we move on. Yep. Yeah. So, so um, yeah, this is what I would like to call. It's a good tool for you know what you might call pseudo structured data. So it's not truly unstructured data like free text, but things that where I say the data is not in a tabular format, but it longs to be in rows and columns. So some of the things that we do deal with that can get messy include some semi-structured data. So in Trifacta, we actually deal with JSON and XML structures. Um, and we can actually maintain the nesting, or we can actually unroll them into flat columns. Other things that come up that are sometimes nasty are idiosyncratic log files. And sometimes you might still have one record um, you know, per line, but then actually determining the column breaks is quite messy. In other cases, you might actually have weird delimiters that occur uh, over multi-line blocks, and then you have to combine those. Um, but the underlying thing is that there's actually, think of it as a chess game where like, these operators along the top form the set of moves you can perform. And there are actually uh, um, operators that can transform chunks of rows, for example, flatten them out. Um, so, um, some of these things are expressible. You know, if you want, you can find things that the tool can't handle. Um, but obviously, we've tailored this to, to be um, you know, useful for the vast majority of data sets that we see, you know, certainly a trifecta that our customers are trying to deal with. Yeah, it's a great question. So there's de definitely some hard decisions that have to be made in terms of expressivity. And a lot of times, for each thing that we give up, we want to make sure it's not critical uh, to people's job. But in doing so, we often get other benefits, whether it's in simplicity or better inference, et cetera. Great, any other questions about this tool? Great, so this was the original research prototype. You know, we've since went on to uh, productize it and make a number of different additions to it. Um, and here's an example of uh, the current version. This is um, the Trifacta Wrangler product. And you can see we have the, the table as before, but we also have visualizations. You know, so for each of these columns, we have you know, histogram views. And the same interactions I just demonstrated before work. So for example, I wanted to break up these names. You know, I could select them, and you see I get suggestions along the bottom showing different um, you know, extraction procedures. I also get a preview here in the table of what the result would be. Um, but in this case, I don't really care about breaking up the names, so I'll go ahead and hit Escape. Um, you know, what, some of the additions we've had, obviously, are these uh, visualizations. But we've also you know, gone beyond just tabular views to look at different content representations. So for example, if I go to the column details view, I can actually get profiles for each of the different columns you know, in my data set. So here's a view of all the different candidate IDs. So the data set here is actually um, all of the candidates who are running for office in this cycle. In fact, it's from the Federal Elections Committee. Um, and so doing this, you can see, you know, for the most part, you know, the summary stats look good. You know, candidate ID should be a primary key. And so I do have 100% you know, unique keys, so that's great. But I notice I do have one outlier. And so my top values, which of course are all one, look pretty regular. So why is this an outlier? Well, this is actually a string field by default. So the way we find outliers is by looking at the distribution of string lengths. And you can see the vast majority are all you know, nine character strings. Where we have one, which is the four character string NULL. Now this is not an actual null value. This is the string null. And it turns out this is a really important thing to catch. So when I initially played with this data just in Tableau, which has some join capabilities, um, this automatically got parsed to a null. I then joined these candidate IDs against a bunch of you know, a, a campaign expenditure data. And then what happened was this actually became a collapsing thing for every reported expenditure that was missing an ID. Um, and so if you do that, you know, for example, let's say, well, what, what's, what's going on with this null? Let's just filter to just that null. By clicking it, I actually get transformation suggestions. I can go back to my table. And here's that single record. So it's a person named um, Hunter Duffy, who's an independent candidate. Um, and you can even find his address. He's listed at 3 Wagon Wheel Trail, Westport, Connecticut. So it turns out when I had this erroneous join, he was spend this, looked like this candidate was spending millions and millions of dollars across the entirety of the United States. So I spent an hour trying to figure out who is this power player. He lives in Connecticut, so maybe he's one of these hedge fund guys. And I dig in, it turns out, you know, supporting that theory, Three Wagon Wheel Trail is a private road in a very Tony neighborhood, you know, uh, you know kind of outside of New York. Um, and so then I start really getting my conspiracy theory hat on until I realize, you know, this is all just a bad null that, you know, it was a good test for trifecta because then when I threw it in, it's sort of the first thing it told me was, you know, by the way, we, we have this problem. 
So if I go back to, to this view, I can instead say, OK, let's, let's just get rid of this for now, because it's going to you know, perhaps hurt my downstream analysis. So I can you know, take this deletion transform, add it to the script. You know, and as I do this, then it updates, and I see I now no longer have, have this outlier. And I can continue along and, you know, whoa, that's not good. Did it die? Oh, that's interesting. Never seen that before. That's a printer, apparently. So clearly, I did not appease the demo gods prior to this talk. You're just showing us it's a live, live demo. It, it, it is real software. And it's free, so this version. So you can go download it for yourself, though it does have data set size limitations. Um, you know, for the free version, not when you pay. Um, so now if we go back, let's look at the candidate names. So again, this is a string field. So again, we find outliers based on string length. Um, and then we see you know, there's a number of interesting names. And in fact, this histogram shows us the long tail of all of the you know, outlying candidate names you know, by very, having very long names. So if we want to select those, we can actually filter to just outlying values. Um, and doing that, I can go back to the grid and you know, hopefully you'll find this amusing. We have a number of interesting characters, including His Royal Majesty Caesar St. Augustine de Bonaparte. We have Satan, Lord of the Underworld, His Majesty Prince of Darkness, um, who is a Republican, apparently. And we have, we have uh, you know, two different members of the Harry Potter universe, and then a member of the Dog Party, a, hereto, uh, a heretofore unknown political entity, um, Remo, the cutest dog ever, a mini schnauzer. And so these are actually all records in the actual official campaign finance database. So one can imagine a fun data science project, which is like just what the effect of any of these sort of fringe candidates um, you know, play within, within politics. But in any case, you know, in this way, we can identify some interesting features of our data set that might have otherwise gone unnoticed. And we can continue on. So for example, we can look at the election year. We can see that you know, certainly, as expected, we have the, you know, um, the most transactions for this year. Turns out financial transactions for previous election cycles still occur as people sort of balance their books or do reimbursements. Um, we also can shoot out into the future, including apparently there's a record tagged with 2052. Right, so just this point that you know there is no such thing as clean data, and some of these future values may actually be, um, you know, uh, contributions to uh, candidacies yet to really come to fruition. Other of these are probably data errors. But in any case, we can continue through, and again, not only try to examine the data for potential flaws, but also transform the data using either the table or the visualization as the means of specifying the interaction. So for example, let's say my analysis is really about the presidential race. So it turns out that's candidate office with code P. So I could filter to just those. Turns out there's a number of people who register um, as candidates, but then aren't actually active. Maybe they were from previous cycles, or they, their, their candidacy is no longer um, valid. So in this case, I want to look at just current candidates. I'm going to add that to the script. And so as I'm going through here, I'm not only examining the data, you know, I'm getting it ready for my downstream analysis. And now if I go back to the grid view, you can see I have a, you know, a familiar cast of characters of who all the major presidential candidates were this year. And at this point, I might then want to do other transformations. So for example, this is just a candidate's table. Maybe I want to join it against you know, expenditures or um, you know, uh, donations received. And so I'll spare you all the details, but we have a number of tools for higher level operations, including um, specifying joins, where having you know, selected a table will actually predict the, the join keys for you to, to, to move that along as well. Um, but in the interest of time, I'll go back to the slides. Um, I'm going to give you, a, give you a sense of both the data wrangler tool, as well as then the, the trifactor wrangler we've built since. Now I want to talk a bit about some of the principles you know, underlying them. So prior to doing this work, you know, this was the, kind of the main way people went about doing this. Either they spent hours in tools like Excel if the data sets were small enough to be amenable, or they're coding. Whether that's you know, writing in R or Python, Perl, you name it, uh, people are writing, you know, typically drafting a transformation script. They need to know if it's right, um, so they usually pick a sample of the data or run it until they see an error. And then they have to diagnose the results, initially on the samples. But even when they then take their program and run it at scale, you have to figure out what just happened. Like if the program didn't crash, you still might be using visualization, et cetera, to try and assess if your program was correct. And usually it's not on the first time. And so then you iterate this, this very um, heavy process. Um, so obviously what we would try to do is actually flip this. And that instead what you do is you start by showing the data set in some form, if it's too large, by pulling a sample. 
Initially, that sample might just be, you know, the, the first, you know, couple megabytes or something of the file. Once you know the record-breaking structure, you can then do proper random samples over those records. And then provide um, visual representations, whether as tables or histograms, et cetera, that you can interact with. And those interactions then provide evidence of, of what you might be trying to do. So then that serves as features, which we then allows us to search over the space of operations in our language and then drive predictions. So then we get back you know, a ranked set of possible moves uh, for manipulating the data. And then we found critical to this was actually you know, visualizing the potential effects of those transforms on that sample. And while you're know, looking at the you know, uh, different representations of the transform is useful for disambiguation or for experts, by and large we found that the vast majority of people you know, use the visual previews as their primary means of verifying if the next step is the one they want to take. So really closing this loop and bringing those predictions back into the visual domain was very important. Um, so here's the actual underlying language. Um, part of the design was you know, intentionally to keep the uh, surface area very small, but with a combinatoric uh, you know, set of operations. So obviously you know, we have a sequence of transforms, and this can be things like splitting you know, uh, rows or columns, um, extracting values, filtering rows. You could add formulas to derive new fields, promoting data to metadata, and also structural transformations, such as like pivots or unnests, um, also aggregates, as well as um, uh, table combination operators, join and union. Um, but I think what makes the inference work particularly well is that there's an even smaller set of legal parameter types. So there's a number of different parameters some of these operations will take. Um, but this is basically the full set of legal parameters. So we have text selections, um, which ultimately we're going to result in regular expression rules. Um, column and row selections, uh, formulas, so arbitrary expressions you could type in, as well as enum fields and then kind of typical literals. So to give you a sense of how the underlying application works, let's focus on a microcosm, which is text selection. So here's an area where we actually have a language within a language. So as you saw, we have to infer what the text selection parameters would be. So we actually do a mini inference phase even within here, which then serves as input to the final inference phase over the actual top level verbs. So here's an example from Trifacta where someone selected some terms. So maybe we're looking at um, advertising data. So each one of these is a, you know, a string representing data about an ad impression. So we have you know, maybe the name of it, it's a source from a set of categories, as well as perhaps the screen size of someone's phone when they saw this ad. And so for example, was this a dynamic or you know, was it mobile, et cetera? What, what's the category? Something you might want to extract out for analysis. And so if I showed you exactly how Trifacta thinks about the problem, you would see results like this. Right, so here's everyone's favorite syntax of all time, you know, regular expressions. Um, I know many of you are probably familiar with this, but still, even for experts, these things can be very annoying and sometimes daunting. So let's just focus on that top-ranked extraction procedure. Um, so anyone want to tell me what this does? No, of course you don't. <laughs> so, so here's what it actually says. This is a look behind and a look ahead. So all it's really saying is actually something very simple, which is match the text between ad tam source equals and an ampersand. Um, but you know, we have to instead structure this as the look behind, the look ahead, and then what to match expressed by what not to match. So that's fun enough, not to mention all of the inconsistencies of regular expression syntax, including escaped literals. Um, this is wildly inconsistent, as you know, because sometimes you have to escape special characters. In other cases, you have to escape the literals. Um, so you have to have you know, good language, uh, as well as you know, these different um, you know, syntactic control characters for saying not ampersand with zero or more occurrences as the star, et cetera. And so for these and many other reasons, I think regular expressions have delivered on the proposition of write once and read never. Um, and so obviously we don't want to show this to end users because they're not going to be able to disambiguate the extraction procedures that we're showing to them. But it turns out even for being able to generate these extraction procedures in the first place, we want an alternative representation. So here's where we kind of came up with our language within a language. So instead, this is what a trifacta would show you today. So it's a select text that occurs after add temp source equals and before ampersand. So pretty much a mapping into the way you know, I prosaically described it to you. And so what you'll notice here is that, among other things, we've broken up the selection into a set of prepositions, right? So this after and before. Um, and so here's how it would look. You know, here we have these prepositions. We also have special character classes. So for example, this is all um, lowercase letters um, as one sort of pattern uh, intended to be made readable here. Um, and so if we, if we dig deeper here, these are some of the propositions. You have exact matching, which is you know, match on. You also have matches at the beginning or end of the matched region, which is from to, and then text you know, that is around it. And all of these can be combined. So things can be after, before, or at the beginning or end of the match, or you can match the whole thing directly. And so here's how the inference uh, proceeds. 
So we start with, you know, the user selects text, and they may select one or more things. We actually support negative examples as well, which are really just used for filtering later. Um, and then given those, we then, um, you know, generate a set of tokens. Um, so in some cases, those tokens are the exact text selected. In other cases, we generalize, for example, by character class. So things by, like, numbers, um, upper or lowercase letters. We also have a set of common patterns um, that are predefined, including things like state names or uh, phone numbers, credit cards, emails. So that will actually surface as a uh, general pattern token as well. Then given these, we have to generate, enumerate a whole bunch of clauses. So given these different tokens, we enumerate all the different sets of prepositions that actually match against the user data. And the problem here is really just um, trying to constrain the combinatorial explosion. So there are some heuristics in terms of pattern length um, that, that we use uh, to keep that uh, nicely bounded. This is all being done directly in the browser. Um, and then we look at the face where we then combine all of the clauses that fit. And so then, you know, given a set of individual clauses, we can look at all the combinations um, that are still valid against the user selections. And then we finish off by ranking and filtering. So for example, if we have negative examples, we can filter any of the things that, that um, you know, don't match. Um, and then we have some ranking um, procedures. And so part of the ranking is intrinsic. So for example, given two things that match the same set of, um, of records, um, we might you know, prefer the one that has, is shorter in some sense, like using a minimum description length principles. But the main thing that worked you know, most for us was actually extrinsic measures, where we take these inferred patterns, we run them against the entirety of our sample, and then we actually analyze the statistics of the hit distribution that comes back. So let's just try this you know, intuitively. Here's two results. Um, given the same selection, which is just the name John on the first row, and that's the only input, which of these you think as a default you know, uh, return value might be more preferred? So raise your hand if you think, on average, without any other you know, context, you would you know, prefer the result on the left. And then how many would prefer the result on the right? No one. So anyone want to give me a you know, just so story? Why did you pick the one on the left? The first name. What's that? Someone's first name. Right. So in this case, you have some, some structural information. You see its names, and it seems to be picking out the first name. Now, I mean, in this case, this person has two middle names, or you know, maybe someone's name is Bobby Joe. So I might miss things like that, right? Um, Anything else? So let's say I, I turn this into to gobbledygook. You know, so not names that you could recognize, but rather just you know, strings. I would wager you would still pick the same you know, pattern. I'm curious you know, if anyone has a, a, a reason as to why. Distribution. Right. So tell me about it. Uh, it looks like very normal falling off distribution pattern as opposed to collapsing the universe into one value. Right, so in this case, it collapses the universe into one value. So yet you have sort of this um, you know, fall off distribution here. So you could look at that. Uh, the other thing is also just this case, I get a hit one per row. So even if it was all Johns, I have this sort of consistent hit, whereas this one you know, is hit and miss. I could even look at you know, where in the string proportionally it's occurring. So there's a number of things that you lead me to think that this is more regular. And I can't give you the exact formulation because it's still you know, patent pending. Um, but basically what we're doing is looking at things, including the spacing and distribution of results and turning the number of things per record, where it's happening in a record, where it's happening across the data table, turns out to uh, work as an extremely good heuristic for ranking these different transforms. Um, so we do that to then, you know, then create the, you know, the n best list of the, of the transforms we surface. And then what, you know, kind of zooming back out to the larger language, we basically do follow a very similar process um, for, the, for the top level verbs. So for example, you know, we first the user makes the selection. Yeah, sorry. Two slides before when you showed the, um, <coughs> this one? The one before. Okay. The regular, yeah, the, the text selection propositions. Yeah. So these are much simpler, easier to read because they are much less expressive than yeah, exactly. the regular language. How do you trade off the simplicity? Right. So this is the, one of the points we ran into earlier, too. You often get a trade off between expressivity um, and um, you know, both interpretability in this case, and also ease of enumeration and ranking. And so part of that is just by working intensely in the domain, having a you know, large collection you know, of data sets from different areas, and understanding that these meet the common needs that we see. Now, that may be a need that we run into where these, these don't work. Um, and so some of the things that we've done over time is actually, you know, I mentioned we have certain patterns like email, credit cards. Those types are extensible. So that for new domains, we can actually hand tune common, complex, regular expressions that we then recognize. And then there's always the fallback that if someone wants to write a regular expression, they can still do it in the code editor. So there's that escape patch. So the nice thing is we can get the benefits of this simplified representation while still having, you know, the recourse to the, the more expressive language for those corner cases where it doesn't work. Thanks. Great question.
So anyway, just to, to wrap this up, um, you know, the inference procedure here is similar as to before, except here we're infer inferring parameter sets. We just saw how we infer text selections. Things like column and row selections are a bit more straightforward, though we do have some generalization procedures there as well. You saw the empty row example before. Generate compatible transforms, rank and cluster them, and then present them. And this includes presenting them both you know, as statements you know, in a ranked list, but also in these visual previews. And so we called this approach that we took in Trifacta predictive interaction. And so we saw the autocomplete schema before, right, where you type and then you generate a bunch of suggestions and then you can basically have the user guide or sculpt that prediction space and then make decisions. We then, you know, using Tableau as our example, saw this mapping between formal and visual languages. And what we're doing here um, in Trifacta is an example of combining those two approaches. So as before, we take the, the domain you know, in Trifacta that's the data tables um, and find a visual representation in the form of tabular uh, pre representations as well as histograms. Um, you interact with them by making selections. Um, you get an immediate response in the sense that you see what you're selecting, for example. Um, but then that's also then you know, drives predictions. But in this case, what we have to do then is take those um, features um, and then turn those into um, statements in the underlying language. So we have these search procedures for generating those different things. Um, and then we have to apply them to the data and bring that back to generate the previews. So in each case, we're generating you know, perhaps up to hundreds of language statements, executing them across the sample, and then you know, showing the preview uh, once we do that. And then again, the user has to disambiguate between them. Like Maybe they want to go ahead and pick one of those. Or maybe if they're, if they're comfortable, they can actually go in and directly edit the code snippet that we produce, um, giving them more expressivity. So again, you know, and at the end, of course, we then you know, generate the resulting output program. Again, bringing this you know, a process of guide and decide to the top here. So really, again, combining those two different approaches we saw before. And so, um, so again, we can get, yeah, sorry, Bean. Kind of following up and on the slide before, so when you're deciding, making the design decisions and trying to make sure the trade-off between expressiveness and the simplicity yeah. is well balanced, do you, how do you evaluate in the, during the design process? Because you can't have thousands of users using it every single operator you're editing, is it useful, is it not useful? How do you make sure, is it purely empirical or is there some theory behind it that you rely on? It's, it's, a, it's a bit of both and, I, and it may vary by domain. So in the case of Data Wrangler A, there was you know, multiple decades of research on data cleaning and so we certainly at least know the gamut of techniques that prior research and statistics and databases have looked at. There were also previous languages for data cleaning. So for example, there's a language called Schema SQL, which is a generalization of SQL that also allows you to work with metadata. And then uh, Joe Hallerstein, my collaborator, actually had a system called Potter's Wheel, which had its own variant of that language. So in this case, our design uh, search was seeded with that. So we already had some indication of the space of problems that those could solve. Um, the language evolved um, in part because we were making the language more amenable um, to, to the user interface and vice versa, so there was that, that co-evolution. Um, other empirical parts, though, include you know, building you know, a large corpus of data sets um, and doing a lot of wrangling ourselves. Um, and so there was a lot of kind of like you know, blood, sweat, and tears that also went into some of this verification. The other thing is that it's, it's a long-running process. Like we've introduced new top-level verbs into our language, you know, as we run into new customers or move into new domains over time. So the language isn't just static either. The important part is that you know these things can evolve over time as well. Um, and then finally, there's things like for certain languages, we can actually start to at least formally characterize what the expressive space is. The harder evaluative question is like, is that space sufficient for, for all the tasks that people want to do? Yeah. Um, and as you might imagine, plenty of user testing, you know, along the way. Um, so anyway, you know, revisiting, hopefully I've, you know, shown you how we can reach some of these different objectives by using domain-specific languages. We're able to create a model of the task. Um, so actually kind of reason about what users might do. Um, and then, you know, I haven't talked about it as much, but all the different times the user makes a selection in the user interface based on our predictions, we are getting some supervision back on what was right. So when they're picking something that's fourth in an end best list as opposed to first, um, we record what the, the, what the results of the end best list was, what the user picked, and store it. You could do online learning right there to update weights. We certainly save it for long-term batch learning over time. Um, anytime someone uh, says, no, you picked the wrong data type, I'm going to remap this column to a different data type, that's being saved. So it's interesting thing, we're harnessing supervision all the time. The thing we have to keep in mind is that some subset, probably a healthy subset of those labels, are not accurate either. 
So there's certainly a, a challenging learning problem that I'm not an expert in those, but I think would be very interesting to consider as you're getting um, lots of interesting noisy signals, some of which might be better conditioned by domain than treating sort of as like global supervision. For example, what people do in oil and gas might be different from what they do in finance, and that might reflect in the types of transformations that are, are better for those uh, types of data. In any case, for our approach here, as you saw, the necessary components were one, representations of the content, including what are the different visual means of, of you know, surfacing the content in a way that allows you to interactively you know, provide those features of what you're interested in. The underlying language model, which is both the language itself as well as different statistics. So for example, among other things, we have, you know, as you might expect, you know, a Markov model across all the different transformations. Like, are certain operations more likely to follow others? Um, in addition, over time, we've actually built um, you know, evaluation functions. Like, given a data table, how good do we think it is based on things like the presence of delimiters, the amount of sparsity, or heterogeneous types and columns? So we also have you know, some of these other things that go along with our uh, language model for helping um, rank. And then finally, these preview mechanisms. So being able to execute this quickly enough to then bring back data where we augment the UI to show a preview of what will be done. Um, so many of these often involving you know, kind of careful visual and UI design. And so some of the considerations, I'll go through this quickly since we've touched on most of them. Obviously, expressivity matters. You figure out well, what tasks you need to support, make sure you do so. Problem domain fit. A lot of things we did, and certainly at Trifact as well, is actually something just simple as twiddling the names of these verbs or parameters can matter tremendously to people's understanding of, of the problem. So making sure that A, that the appropriate operations are chosen, and then even getting the terminology correct has proven to be very important. Um, one of the things we care about, obviously, is small surface area. So the smaller, the more we can do with a smaller language, often the better for a number of reasons. Hopefully it's less to learn, but also it permits tractable inference. We're getting a smaller search space along the way. Um, and then the other question that comes up is then in terms of how do you start providing predictions right outside of the box? Like, do you have to go out and collect lots and lots of data before your recommendations are good enough to be usable by others? You know, in our case, we actually bootstrapped it with a variety of heuristics. So basically, given our understanding of the domain, we built in a number of assumptions into our ranking functions, which we then might relax over time. Um, and so there's a number of different approaches to it, um, but certainly we've taken one where let's try and make it as smart as we can based on what we know out of the box, then sort of um, hopefully relax some of those um, assumptions over time as we get more and more data to actually populate out the statistics. Um, and so finally, I think this is, you know, one, you know, data point in terms of a space of possible applications that use this approach. So I think there's a number of open research questions. I think one of which is just trying to understand what's the space of applications where this approach might provide benefits. Um, some of these we're looking at in my lab currently. So one example is a system called Voyager, which is a, a built to help enable early exploratory data analysis. So in this case, you load a data table. In this case, it's one about movies. And then you're automatically given suggestions of visualizations. Initially, it's just all of the univariate summaries. Like in a good analysis, you don't want to race ahead. You want to understand what's the data you're working with, what are some of the features or even you know, anomalies that you need to know of that might um, you know, ruin um, or um, undermine subsequent analysis. And then you can continue to search. So for example, in this case, I'm interested in IMDB ratings, so I can select that. And then I get visualizations specific to that field. So first things that just visualize it, but then I can maintain sort of a search frontier and then start adding additional variables. And then I might want to you know, enumerate and rank those as well. So again, I actually have an underlying formal language for visualization. I'm going to enumerate possible visualizations conditioned on my current selections um, and then and rank and present those. And I can go forward. For example, maybe I'm interested in how IMDb compares with Rotten Tomatoes. So what do viewers think versus critics? And see, for the most part, they agree, but there's some interesting outliers you might explore. And then as I look one step ahead in the search frontier, I might ask questions like, well, are there interesting patterns if I subdivide by things like genre or creative type? And in this case, color was chosen to show that category of creative type um, because it fits nicely in this browser. But maybe I want to show visualizations that were initially cold. So for example, I could expand that and say, show me the other uh, top ranked visualizations that you chose not to show at the high level gallery. And so, for example, I might get a clearer picture by instead looking at a small multiples view, which instead of using color, actually shows me separate partitions so I can see those patterns more clearly. And again, the basic idea is that we have a la formal language and we're actually doing ranking search and enumeration with these guide decide loops. And so, lots of opportunities and challenges await. I won't speak through all of these, but you can kind of get a picture. Interesting things include how well are we supporting not just ambiguity of the input, but of intent. Are people coming up with new things to do that hadn't occurred to them? 
We certainly hear that in the case of Voyager and in Trifacta. A lot of times people came in with a vague notion of what they were doing, but was actually slightly incorrect. And the suggestions actually helped them find a better way to work with their data. Other things include more proactive suggestions. What happens when you start suggesting things right off the bat as opposed to reacting to user input? We've done some studies around that. You can ask me about it later if you're interested. Um, they're sort of counterintuitive in terms of how people deal with predictions. And all sorts of other things. How do you deal with error in your programs? Um, we actually have an outer loop thing where you actually can visualize the results of running a transform at scale to see if it did what you thought. So there's both this sort of this inner loop of previews and this outer loop of visualizing or profiling the results of large scale batch jobs. And finally, since I'm primarily a human computer interaction and data viz researcher, I'm interested in what are the implications for UI toolkits. I really think these are like you're taking notions of UI toolkits and, and starting to combine it with ideas um, from AI and machine learning as well. Um, but first, at the top level, it's just what are tools for designing domain specific languages more effectively? Even if you made some very severe assumptions in terms of just sequential languages, could you actually build tools that allow designers, the people who go out into the field and actually do qualitative research who are understanding these tasks, begin to draft the language? Can you actually have a way where people who might even be as technically as strong um, can actually think about what these, these verbs could be in a way that then feeds into the rest of the development process? I think once you have a good language in place, it's interesting to think about what aspects of the UI could actually be synthesized as well. Um, you know, obviously, you still have to implement what the actual operation is. But in terms of reasoning about the structure of the UI, things like automatically generating menus should be pretty straightforward. You should be able to get things like history of undo, redo, et cetera, because really any state of the application is really just a snapshot of that program in time. So a lot of the plumbing of a UI might actually be able to generate it um, fairly automatically. And then developers would have to come in and do things like if you had custom UI components. I might have built-in things like text boxes and drop-downs and, and, and a variety of, of you know, higher level widgets. But still, at some time, I'm going to have to build custom UI or visualization components. So understanding how this kind of affects that development process is interesting. But perhaps most relevant to the folks here is in thinking about how we can also synthesize things that help the interface learn over time. If I have a set of, sort of, of standard types of estimators or classifiers, can I automatically tag the results of those and trace how they come through the UI? So if my end best list is populated from the outputs of a classifier, I want to know about that relationship and have that appropriately logged. And then what are, are the reusable mechanisms I might use um, to improve those models over time? So thinking about not just how I synthesize like UI Chrome, but really how do I help synthesize all the feedback loops that allow the, the correct statistics and learning to take place over time? Um, so some of this is being done. Certainly, we're working on a number of these architectural issues in our work at Trifacta. But I think it's interesting to start to think about how they might be abstracted into more reusable primitives uh, for building an entire class of user interfaces. And so that's speculative. But I think even success in one of these areas might have really nice ripple effects in terms of being able to build better interactive and predictive systems. So with that, um, you know, wrap up. Um, just to review some of the objectives and the, the strategies that we looked at today. Um, I'd love to hear your thoughts or questions. So thanks for your attention.